Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'd like to begin with a brief introduction of Sarah. Sarah is an English writer. She lives in London, travels extensively, and writes travel books and biographies of people who travel. She began her writing career in the early 1990s with books about Greece and Chile, but it's her books about the polar regions that are best known. In the mid-1990s, she spent seven months in Antarctica as writer in residence, and that experience led to her bestseller, Terra Incognita. Next came two biographies, one about the Antarctic explorer, Aspie Cherry Garrard, and one on Dennis Finch Hatton. Then she was drawn back to the polar regions, this time to the Arctic, which resulted in the Magnetic North, which was published in 2010 and was chosen by Michael Palin as his book of the year. More recently, her book, Oh My America, celebrates the lives of six feisty women who set out for America in the first half of the 19th century. Now, Sarah, I'd like to begin the conversation, please, by talking about the polar regions. And in particular, perhaps we could begin with Antarctica, since that was the first place you visited. Yes, certainly. Um, so, um, what I want to do, first of all, I've got a prop here. I bet nobody knows what this is. And I'm going to pass it round. It's not fragile. And you can all look at it. And at the end, there's going to be a competition um, with a prize. I'm not quite sure what the prize is going to be for who can identify what this is. So, Anthony, do you want to take this and pass it around? As I say, it's not fragile. But it's very much to do with my polar journeys. So, um, I am very much a generalist as opposed to a specialist. It's rather unfashionable, but I feel someone's got to be one. So every book is a new departure. And uh, I wrote a book about Chile, um, which I thought was going to end at Cape Horn when I did a journey. It's a very long, thin country, as you know, from the top, the Peruvian border, to the bottom. But then I discovered when I was halfway down that Chile claims a slice of Antarctica. There's seven countries that claim a bit of the Antarctic. The claims are not recognized by anybody and don't mean anything, but it's very important uh, to a young country. And as an English writer uh, uh, coming from a very old country, it was very difficult for me to understand what it's like if you only became ind independent in 1821. Um, and you guys, you know, have a lot more recent experience than that. But the point is, is that their claim of Antarctic territory was extremely important to them. And in fact, it's illegal to publish a map in Chile without um, showing that. It's like a slice of a cake, a triangle. Um, so I had to go down there to complete my portrait of contemporary Chile. And... Uh, what you do as a travel writer is you, you know, try really hard to represent faithfully the people, the indigenous people of the country you're writing about, to be a true reporter and witness to their experience. And in particular, in a country like Chile, which has been a very, had been a very tragic and dramatic experience. So I had to go down to the Antarctic and I got there and I suddenly saw one I spent so long, so many years, trying to represent the experience of people, indigenous peoples and suddenly you're in this place one and a half times the size of the United States where there's no people. It was paradise. Nobody you had to represent. Um, Antarctica doesn't sustain uh, terrestrial life. The, all, all the um, animal life there is marine. It lives off the sea. And there's no water. And so it couldn't sustain human life either. So uh, at the end of my book about Chile, I decided um, this is what I'm going to write about next. And I was, I was a young writer then. Um, and uh, Antarctica seemed to me to represent uh, a symbol of what the Earth could be. It's not polluted. It's not spoiled, nobody owns it, nobody's ruined it. There's no indigenous peoples who've been disenfranchised. And I think young writers have got to think about hope and have hope. And that's what the Antarctic was. And for me, it was the perfect tabula rasa. 
um, literally a sort of blank sheet in which to describe what I saw, because what travel writers do, you describe what you see and what you hear and what you feel and what you smell and what you taste, but not all at the same time. Um, and uh, it kind of suited who I was then at that stage. And I wasn't remotely interested in the Arctic, the North, because it was the opposite. It's owned. There are people there who have fights. There are indigenous people who are economically and socially and culturally disenfranchised. Um, everybody's squabbling about it all the time. So it was the opposite, and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. But the years went by, and um, I wrote a ton of books and had some kids, and then when I turned 50, uh, I suddenly looked north and thought, actually, the Arctic is a symbol of what the Earth really is. It's a symbol, and it's where we learn that there are no questions there are no answers, there are any questions, and we're never going to learn anything. So, to a certain extent, I grew into it, and it became something that was uh, preoccupied me in my 50s of looking at this place, which very much is a symbol of the horror we have created. Global warming's a part of that. We'll talk a bit about that later. Um, that was a very long answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you touched on, on it briefly then, but just in terms of thinking about Antarctica, is when you think about it, it's, it's very cold, it's very white, it's very isolated. How did that impact on you when, you when you were there? How did it make you feel, being in Antarctica? It made me feel like I was seeing the planet for the first time, like it would have been before we mucked it all up. And as I say, the terrestrial, the, the, um, none of the animals have any terrestrial predators. So the emperor penguins, they won't leave you alone you're trying to fight them off, you know. They're coming up to you, look in your eyes. And when an animal looks in your eyes and has no fear, I think it sort of says something. The cold was, the cold was pretty, yeah, it was hard. The coldest I had was minus 115 with wind chill, which is pretty cold. Well, how do you stay warm in, in that? What well, you've got a, a lot of good kit. What's the issue is, is not staying warm. It's... Um, there's a f certain amount of things you have to do, like, for example, keeping your radio schedule going. Uh, so you have a radio schedule on um, high frequency with uh, your, the local base. And if you don't make it on your allotted time, they're going to send a search and rescue. And you really don't want that to happen, because that's people risking their lives for you. So at minus 115, with gloves on, you've got to keep this wire going. You're completely impractical and hopeless person like me. So that was really the most scary thing, was uh, making sure that nobody else was at risk. I can take responsibility for myself. But um, I was a guest of the American government at that time and um, had to learn quite quickly about um, the... Um, well, how you, how you live in the middle of nowhere. One of the things I most enjoyed about, about the Antarctica book, Terra Incognita, is um, the, the people that you meet along the way. I mean, there's some fantastic characters in, in the book. I wonder if you could say something about what kind of people are drawn to Antarctica. Yes. Um, and once they're drawn to it, they never stop being drawn to it. They always come back. Um, well, to start with, the scientists, um, it's a pristine environment for many types of science. For example, astrophysics, because the Earth's atmosphere is at its shallowest at the poles. So they have big um, telescopes that look up and they can um, really gather data, which would be difficult to gather really anywhere else except of kind of few places on the planet. Um, and likewise, obviously, marine biologists they are not going to get their data, and glaciologists, for obvious reasons. And also the measuring of how fast the ice sheet's melting, uh, which you have to put down. What you have is in, in the Antarctic is you have a, 
uh, it's, it's a continent and you have a layer of ice on top of it and it's like icing on a cake, on a wedding cake, and it's flowing off like that. And the key thing for global warming is how fast is it flowing? And so you have to put down um, instruments a long way um, and measure that. And they do the same thing in Greenland as well. And that's it's really the cutting edge of what global warming is. So, yeah, scientists who are very passionate about what they did, what they do, and also um, there's a lot of support workers who are everything from plumbers to cooks to whatever, and they tend to be people who are just. I mean, if you were unkind, you'd say they couldn't hack it in the real world. But I like to look at it as they're ones who have the bigger imagination than the, anybody else. So is it a different breed of person in Antarctica to the Arctic? No, they're often the same, because of course right. it's the opposite seasons. Right. So you often find that they're the same oh, ones. Oh, you get the same people support, going back yeah. and forth. Oh. Support workers, yeah, very much so, yeah. Could, could you tell us a bit more about your Arctic trips? Because you did a number of, of trips for that, didn't you, for that book? Yes, I did. Um, it's very difficult to do a circumpolar Arctic journey without coming back to London in the middle. So I went up and came down and went up and came down and went up and came down through all the uh, polar, uh, the Arctic countries. So that's Russia, Finland, Sweden, um, Alaska, Canada, of course, um, and uh, the Norwegian islands. So I sort of hopped around between them all. Have you got some pictures? I do, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so this looks like um, <clears throat> a telegraph pole. Um, and in fact, this is one of the most sacred uh, sites of Arctic science because in the 1970s, there were two teams of scientists, one Danish, one American, who were drilling down into the ice, making a hole um, several miles long, and as I told you, measuring the speed of the ice flow. And they would, that was, when you read things in the papers about the planet is warming, that is where it happened. That was the key site of uh, bringing the message of global warming to the public. Um, and they've sort of main maintained that as a, yeah, a sacred site. That's me paying homage. So the difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic is basically described by one word, which is life. There's life in the Arctic. There's no life in the Antarctic. And here's an Inuit hunter uh, leaping between flows to go and catch his fish. And there's an English writer uh, sitting next to a sledge with her skidoo behind her on the top of the Greenland ice sheet, um, writing notes in a notebook. Lead freezes, I learned, so pencil is unreliable. I don't sure if this that translates into Cantonese. Um, this is me going up the um, Alaskan. Uh, the, it's a, basically a continuation of the Pan American Highway that goes from Cape Horn to Vancouver. Um, and this is in the north of Alaska. There's a place called Gobbler's Knob, which I thought was tremendously funny at the time. So um, this is a poster. Uh, that was published by the Alaskan uh, provincial government. And it's uh, promoting the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline. So that takes oil from the Alaskan coast, very far north, right the way down, that's it. It has to zigzag, because that's how you make it stop freezing on the way. And... Uh, Nobody lives here except various groups of indigenous people. So the government had to persuade the indigenous people that this was going to be a good idea. And this is the poster that they published, part of our past, here for the future. 
one of those statements is true. Which one is it? It's not part of their past. Why is hydrocarbon extraction anything to do with their past? They've been living there for thousands of years. But it's certainly here for the future. And it's, I, part of the reason I show this slide is it's very much a part of the whole picture across the second polar north of governments dragging indigenous peoples into the cash economy and trying to persuade them of things which actually don't really stack up to very much. I'm not saying they shouldn't get their oil out. Alaska needs the oil. But what about the people who live there? Like this, this guy. In, in, um, what they tend to do with the reindeer across the Circumpellar North is they, there's hardly anybody is a nomad anymore. Unfortunately, it's sort of become not possible. But what they do is they take them all up at the beginning of summer to the high pastures and then bring them down at the end of summer and then look after them. And that's a little Finn with his reindeer um, in the 16th century. Uh, gives you some idea of the continuity of how people have been living there for so many years, so many generations. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so this is obviously a supermarket. Now this is Chukotka in the Russian Far East. So if you look at a map, and go as far right as you can, and, and before you get to America, that's the Russian Far East. It's further east than Siberia. And it's a region, this, the autonomous region called Chukotka, and it's um, the size of France, and there's no roads except in the capital. And this is the first supermarket they've ever had. And the reason I'm showing you this picture is Here's a fellow from Chukotka, 40 years ago, bringing home his tea, So, which is a whale head. To so go from that to that in 40 years, that's a really short time. And bad things happen if you have that cultural acclimatization so quickly. Oh, yeah, that was just my picture of haircut of the year. Okay, so this is Chukotka. It's, that's not quite Alaska that you can see over there. That is the Bering Strait. But America's just beyond that. And uh, it was not nearly so grotty as most of uh, Russia. I've spent a lot of time over the past years traveling in Russian cities. It's not nearly as grotty as most of them. And they've got these lovely murals, as you can see, of... Um, traditional scenes. I thought, God, this is very un-Russian. Uh, and then I noticed all these little boys running around with Chelsea football caps on. And it turns out that Roman Abramovich, who owned Chelsea Football Club, uh, decided to headquarter his companies in this remote region, which is, because this is, this is seven time zones away from Moscow. The headquarters company is there because the tax base is nil. And uh, while he was at it, might as well become governor. So Roman Abramovich is the governor of this vast region, which nobody has ever heard of, nobody ever goes to. It's closed to foreigners. So I had to lie, lie and get my way in there. Um, on the Bering Strait. And, uh, you know, he's done quite a good job in terms of infrastructure. But... I feel that's quite telling in terms of uh, what the reality of Russia is. Yeah, so there's the reindeer herds coming down. Anyone know who that is? Come on. Somebody knows. Okay, that's the greatest polar explorer who's ever lived. He's a Norwegian called Fridtjof Nansen. And uh, he was exploring in the 1890s and covered more ground than any other polar explorer in the Arctic ever had. 
And then he was also a neuroscientist, very distinguished in his field. And there's um, some fibers in the back of your neck, which are called, still called Nansen fibers now. And he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1918 for introducing uh, passports for refugees. And uh, he had made this epic journey in 1895 um, and uh, was determined to get to the North Pole and the ship got stuck in the ice. So they couldn't get there. So him and his colleague, uh, one of his colleagues, decided to set off with skis and kayaks to try and get rescue, to save all these people from dying. They didn't know where they were going or where they were. And they did rather well, and they got to an island, Franz Josef Land, it's called, and um, the night came down, so they knew they had to um, stay there for the winter. So they slept in the same sleeping bag for five months, the two of them, and then the sun rose again. And um, on the day the sun rose again, Nansen uh, wrote in his diary, I suggested to celebrate, we should start calling one another by our first names. <laughs> Having spent the whole winter in a sleeping bag. And uh, they sort of have no idea where they were, but they set off again. And there was this English person, uh, Jackson Harmsworth, his name was, who happened to be just around the corner. And they heard a dog barking, and they all got home and were rescued. And it was all gorgeous. So. Um, one thing I wanted to write about quite a lot in my book is uh, um, all the explorers, they had girlfriends amongst the indigenous peoples. Um, and there's a guy called Admiral Peary. I don't know if had, has anyone heard of Admiral Peary? Anyway, in 1906, he claimed to be the first person to get to the North Pole. And he was a massive American hero. And that was his Inuit girlfriend. And he was a very uh, accomplished photographer. And um, he uh, took those pictures of her. And of course, the guys all sailed away again. I never saw them again, never saw the women again, and never contributed in any way. And so there's all these children. And I thought that was a sort of story that should be told. And this is another example. This is an English expedition. Um, run by that guy, Gino Watkins, who was extremely distinguished Cambridge explorer in the 20s. And what they were trying to do then was uh, they were paid by uh, aviation companies because what the aviation companies needed to do, because you had to go across the polar regions to fly transatlantically. So the aviation companies needed to um, know where to fuel, have their fuel caches and so on. So they, they uh, but, so they, that's what these guys were doing. They're all very... But this is my point. Look at them all with their Inuit girlfriends. I feel they're the unspoken folk of polar history. They've never so been... So what happened to their children? Nothing. I mean, they go, they're abandoned. No money. Ever sent. No guys never came back. And I feel, you know, why was that story never told? That's Gino there, he was the leader. Look at her, she looks very pleased with herself. So, um, that is uh, Wheeler Jr. Um, I did, uh, took a ice, Russian icebreaker across the Arctic Ocean and took one of my sons with me. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, it was really great. And um, the crew adopted him. He was the only kid. And so when it came to him choosing what languages he was going to learn at school, I said to him, uh, you can't do Russian because the only words you know are filthy swear words that <coughs> you learn off those sailors. Oh, I'm so sorry. <coughs> Speak again if you can't hear. Um, so that was in the um, ice. Okay, and this is Wheeler Jr. Um, Wheeler Jr. Jr. You can barely see him, can you? 
um, so I told you about the reindeer coming up and down, and I took um, that baby uh, with me, and um, they said to me, uh, I was with the Sami people who are laps, <clears throat> and I was Phil, if you've got a kid with you, as long as you're with other women who've had kids themselves, they're going to tell you what to do. And they said, uh, put foil, tin foil, down your shirt, because then it reflects the heat, so you can breastfeed, <laughs> um, which I duly did. And then they said, uh, we were in our lafu, which is um, a, a traditional Sami tent, and uh, having reindeer broth stew. And they gave me some uh, cubes of yellow, butter yellow reindeer fat. And they said, uh, that's for you to give the baby. And I said, he's not weaned yet. And they said, well, that's what we wean him with. But I thought maybe that was a step too far. And here we have another guy. Uh, see, he's doing that business I told you about, of bringing, the, bringing them down and cor cor literally corralling them. And then what happens is, uh, so this is in Sweden, in Arctic Sweden, and what happens is each family, they don't own them because the, the beasts are owned collectively, but each family will look after um, the reindeer in their winter grounds. Okay, has anybody heard of Rockwell, Kent? Anybody heard of Rockwell, Kent? Anyway, a fantastic American artist in the period of modernism in the, 18, the 1940s, when he, was, he came, went to Greenland to escape from the horror of contemporary America, as he perceived it. And that was his um, housekeeper, and he uh, wrote about her and drew pictures of her, Salamina. And that's, just, again, to show the history going back. This is a Finnish man praying to his gods, represented by... Um, antlers uh, in the 17th century. And there we are, back at the end where we began. I'm just wondering, I mean, some of the explorers we've just seen there, I mean, uh, the explorers were almost exclusively men, and most of the people who have written about the polar regions have been men as well. So Correct. how do you think you came at it differently as a woman writing? Well, that's a kind of difficult question to answer, Kate, but I think um, certainly a lot of the explorers in our own time who've written about the polar regions, their agenda has been conquering. The environment is something to be beaten into submission, like another mammoth in the cave. And I don't think women do think of it like that. Um, I think there was a certain sense of... Um, priority as well, that I think they thought it belonged to them, which it doesn't. It belongs to everybody. I have as much right to be there as they do, and I don't need to pull my sledge 10,000 miles and have one my digits removed to have any right to do that. I don't do it that way. I think it's for everybody to see and write about, and I think it's wrong that there should be any part of the world where men think they've got some sort of priority. I'm just wondering what it is that draws you to these extremes, the Antarctica, Arctic, what's the appeal? Well, that's a hard question to answer as well. Um, as I said, first of all, the Antarctic, it was a question of a, this absolute blank sheet of paper. Um, and also, I think it's trying to interpret I mean, I'm a writer, I'm trying to interpret places and take people there. So one's bound to be affected by places that haven't been overexposed before. Um, I think that there are things we can learn. Who are your favorite, or the women writers, women travel writers, who you would most admire? There's a lot of women travel writers I admire. Um, a lot of the Victorians, Mary Kingsley, Freya Stark. Um, you know, there's ones that wore long, thick 
tweed skirts and battled through malarial swamps with their parasol aloft, followed by a hundred factotums. Um, really good writers. There's a lot of war correspondents who I think of as travel writers, like Habatha Gellhorn, uh, and of course your own. Do you want to say Claire. a little bit about her? Because people might not know her. Yeah, well, Martha Gellhorn, well, she was a war correspondent, um, <clears throat> and uh, she covered the Spanish Civil War, and she was married for a while to uh, Hemingway. Um, and she was a fantastic writer, and she was said she was very angry all the time about everything, and her mission in life as a writer was to protest about injustice. And, of course, you've got your own Claire Hollingsworth, um, who I'm very sorry I never met, um, who lived here in Hong Kong, who was, they were writing the fighting. Thinking of women writers, I mean, in your most recent book, Oh My America, so you're, you're looking at six quite feisty women who go to America in early 19th century. And all of them, I think, were writers, weren't they? Or they all wrote. Five of the six were writers, Five yeah. Five of the six. Um, could you say something a little about, about that book and um, yes, how you yes, chose sure, yeah. women? Well, I've always liked America, and I've always liked Americans and been very drawn to it. And it seemed to me that that period of the 19th century, between about 1827 and 1877, when America was becoming itself, 1877, when the train linked the, the two coasts, um, and... Uh, I just turned 50 myself and was interested in the second act. Um, and one thing led to another. There was one woman, there was another woman, there was another woman. And uh, I collected the six who uh, had all been to America during that 50-year period, but not just to swan around and be glamorous. They'd gone for economic need. Um, the first one was Fanny Trollope, who was Anthony's mother. And she had a useless husband. In fact, useless husbands are quite a theme of this book, a fact that my husband has never ceased to point out to me. Um, and so she had to go to try and make a go of, try and make some money. And she took two of her kids with her, and everything was a complete disaster. And she left in penury. The children didn't have shoes. And then she came back and wrote a book. Domestic Manners of the Americans. So she redeemed everything. That book made her a star, got her money. She redeemed everything through her own efforts, and I really admired that. And then I sort of found these others, other ones. One was Jane Austen's niece, um, who went to California um, just before the railway joined up the two coasts. Um, one was a homesteader. And it was redemption, really, through um, redemption through suffering, and also um, no surrender. Can you, you turn say something? fifty? It's no surrender. You know, no surrender. You keep going. The That's what that book was about. The second Fanny in the book, the um, actress Fanny Campbell. Can you say something? Because her, her story is great. Her story is amazing. Uh, so um, the late. Um, was it late 18th century, early 19th century? Uh, the theatrical world in London was very dynastic. It was the Garricks and this and that. And Fanny Campbell was born into a uh, theatrical family and at the age of 21 became um, a massive superstar. I mean, her picture was on the front page of all the newspapers through playing Juliet. And she went on one of the first uh, theatrical tours of the United States um, in 1830. And again, uh, massive superstar success. And one of the guys sitting in the front row on every performance was this uh, Philadelphian heir who, of a plant, slavery plantation. And he wooed her and married her. And it was an absolute disaster. She, they had two kids, and she, um, he then basically treated her like a slave. And she had no redress, and it was all an absolutely terrible disaster. And she came back to the UK. Of course, she didn't have any rights to custody or anything like that. 
And then it came to the American Civil War, and she decided uh, she needed to speak up because she'd lived on some of his slave plantations in Georgia and has seen the reality of what slavery was and wrote incredibly um, graphically about it. And in fact, there's still some Southern historians now who say Fanny Campbell changed the tide of opinion in the UK against the slave-owning South, so that you know, getting the Yankees on their side. And she was, I really admired her. She was so robust and spoke her mind, didn't see her daughters for years. And she just spoke out for what she thought was right. And to a certain extent, Oh My America, what I feel it is, it's a celebration of what women could do at a time when, not like the world you and I live in, at a time when it was hard to speak out or do anything worthwhile, and they did. I mean, I mean that book, Oh My America, like most of your books, are really, really well researched. And again, you're using a lot of historical fact, but you're also going to these places yourself. How, how do you logistically go about that? Do you do all the research before and then you visit, or do you do it on the road? Well, it's a sort of a, it's a mixture of the two, really. Um, yeah, it's uh, you just, you know, take each step as it comes. There is a lot of research, but research is easy. It's writing that's hard. Every day is a success when you research. Every day is a failure when you write. That's how I look at it. Um, you can't do too much research. Um, if a, a young women come to me to ask my advice, which they often do about being a writer in my field, the first thing I say to them is, you have to read all the time, and then you've got half a chance. You have to read all the time. And I think... I'm right in thinking that you write all the time as well. Didn't you say that even while you're here, you're still doing your yes, hours you can't writing? Yes, you can't stop yourself, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, you can't stop yourself. I've always got a notebook on the go. And things come... I go back to my notebooks sometimes after years, you know. I'm sure you do too, looking things up. So I'm wondering, what do you think it takes to be a travel writer now? We've, we've thought a lot about historic... Um, travel writers, big names. What about uh, you know the really good travel writers now? What are the qualities that you need to be successful? Well, I think there's the same. The qualities, Kate, you asked me about, the same as they've always been. You've got to conjure a sense of place. You've got to make them see, taste, smell, hear, feel. They're not all at the same time. Um, you've got to take people there. And, um, yeah, conjuring a sense of place, I think that's the key. As and have something yeah. to say. You've got to smuggle something in there that's about something. I mean, what is there to write about besides what it is to be human? What else is there? Nothing. So you've got to smuggle that in somehow. I hope I do. I'm curious, so, so the people who read your books, that, uh, I guess a lot of them who read about the Arctic and Antarctic actually don't actually, they're not reading it like a travel guide because most people probably aren't oh, going to get no. to go there. So there are lots of people write to me saying, uh, I can't imagine anything more horrific than going to the Antarctic. And I've got no desire ever to go there. But I'm really pleased that you've taken me there in your book. So I'm armchair traveling. And I feel the same about books I read about foreign countries. Often it's not places I particularly want to go, but it's someone who's taking me somewhere. I mean, we as a, we're, as a human race, we're traveling more now than ever before. And there are very few places left that are unexplored. Does it spell the death knell for travel writers? Absolutely not, no. I mean, I think that the daily detail, the minutiae of life still goes on in every place in the world. The going around the supermarket shelves looking for a cheaper type of cheese, all that kind of thing. The daily detail still goes on and I think can be more revealing. I feel I've had more revealing conversations at kitchen tables in the Andes with a woman who's just talking about the challenges of her kids. That is never going to stop. 
it's never going to end. So I think travel writing has a huge future. So when you travel, are you, are you trying to stay with local families when you're travelling? I try to as much yeah. as I can, yeah. As much as I can, yeah. I'm very keen on homestays and, uh, yeah, and to, you have to talk to people all the time if you're going to be true. I mean, that's all you can do is be true. Try and be true and be faithful to the people you're reporting about. And you have to talk to them. So I'm wondering, what are you writing now? Uh, I'm writing a book about Russia. <laughs> um, it's about the golden age of Russian literature, so um, Pushkin, the death of Tolstoy, and about my travels around Russia, um, although not Moscow and Petersburg, which I'm not very interested in. Um, so it's kind of looking at the prism, looking at the, what Russia is through the prism of the literature, but it's taking me an awfully long time, and I've written two chapters. <laughs> In how long? <laughs> how long has it taken um, to write? Fucking years. <laughs> but isn't that you almost have to collect all the information, and and then you can write? Yeah, to a certain but extent. Although I think you have to take your foot off the pedal at some stage. You know, I've done. My books normally take me about three years. And um, all throughout when I was having my kids and doing everything and making it and making good and all the rest of it, I kept going. And I just think you've got to sort of slightly have a break at some stage. So when someone says, would you like to come to Hong Kong and talk at the gorgeous book fair, you think, what would I like more than do that? Are there any places that you haven't visited that, that are on your wish list to travel yeah, to? Yeah, no, everyone always thinks I've been everywhere, but I haven't. Um, I reckon I've been to half the countries in the world. So that means there's half the countries in the world I haven't been to. I'm very attracted to go back to South America where I haven't been for a, well, I went to Argentina actually last year, but a lot of countries in South America I haven't been to and I would very much like to do that. Um, Isn't that where you first started traveling extensively? Was that South America? Uh, no, not really. When I first started travelling extensively was in Europe and in Greece. Um, but I feel it's only Chile I know well, in Argentina I know a little bit, in Brazil I know a little bit, but it's the Spanish-speaking countries I'm most interested in. I always thought when the kids left home I'd write a book about Venezuela, but it's very dangerous at the moment. Mm -hmm. Have so, you travelled much in Asia? I, quite a lot, uh, not as much as I'd like. Um, I did six weeks in China um, uh, in 2012. I took the kids and my husband and we were travelling independently and um, in the countryside and really had an absolutely fantastic time. Absolutely loved it. And I travelled a little bit in China and in Thailand and Malaysia and I was just in Vietnam last week. Um, but there's an awful lot more I'd like to do, an awful lot more. Do you feel compelled, like, even when you're travelling with your family, to write? Or if, if you're working, then you write? And if yeah, you're... You can't, as I said, you can't stop yourself. Uh -huh. And you never know when it's... Cause somebody always comes out of the woodwork and says, do you want to do this, do you want to do that? And you think, oh, I'll just go back to my notebook and just read what exactly Kate said to me on that night in Hong Kong. And so I, you know, yeah. Do you transcribe your notes or it's, you just leave everything handwritten? Um, I only transcribe things if they're um, destined for something. Like, for example, with this Russia book, I transcribe everything as soon as I get home. Um, but something like this, I would probably leave it, leave it in notebooks. I'm wondering if people, I suspect people might have questions. If we could turn it over to the floor. Has anyone got any questions? Yeah. Just a second. Uh, just a quick one. Do you always have an interpreter with you when you travel? I don't always, actually, and it's difficult. Um, I mean, you know, interpreters can be expensive, and if I'm on a low budget, um, 
So, not always. If I'm doing a piece for, for example, a, like a hard news piece for a magazine, then I'd have to. Um, but often, um, I don't. Um, and uh, I kind of slightly feel that words are just one medium, and there are others, you know, you can, you can talk in other ways. In China, certainly that's what happened. Could you tell us a little bit more about your time in China? Yes, I can. I had a fantastic six weeks in China. Um, it was during the London Olympics, and we rented out our house um, to pay for the, our trip. And I took my kids and my husband, and we went to Yunnan, Mongolia, and Guilin and did it all independently, and it was tremendously successful. Everybody was really friendly. The food was unbelievably delicious. And we spent a lot of time with non-Han people, um, with ethnic minorities. Um, and the kids learnt to do calligraphy and all kinds of things. And it was a, a really very wonderful experience, extremely beautiful, you know, the landscapes we saw. And, uh, yeah, very friendly. And um, no difficulties, really. It did take a long time to organise it. It did. Um, but uh, my children still remember it so well, and so do I. Mongolia was just wonderful. Unfortunately not, no. I'd have to be there a lot longer and I don't have the expertise. And I wrote a lot of magazine articles. I, wrote, I did a big piece of Vanity Fair and, yeah, I think four or five big magazine articles I wrote. Yeah, which I'm sure you can find on the internet. Yeah, I loved it. absolutely loved it. And so did they. I'm just wondering that, <laughs> seeing these pictures of, of you at the pole and, and when you're in Antarctica, it's so cold. How, how are you actually physically writing? Are you using a notebook? Well, it's very difficult because graphite does shatter at low temperatures and f ink goes to pot as well. So it is very difficult. There's something called waterproof paper which you can write on which actually does better at low temperatures. Um, somehow or other I managed to do it, God knows how. I made a radio program when I was there as well, and in, um, of course you can't do anything digital, so I had a battery, uh, what do you call them, like a battery tape recorder, and you've got to, but you have to sleep with it in your sleeping bag, because otherwise the batteries are going to die. And you've also got to sleep with your pens and with a pair of socks. So you end up, it's like sleeping in a cutlery drawer. <laughs> Not in a good way. I'm just wondering now about, um, I recall you saying that, you know, you were sharing a tent on the glacier. And I'm just wondering, what, what's the etiquette if you need to go for a pee in the middle of the night? How do you manage it? <clears throat> well, um, Toilet arrangements in extreme environments are quite complicated. Um, first of all, uh, you can't go very far away from the tent because a blizzard could come in in two seconds flat and then you'll be lost and you'll die. So they have a pea flag in lots of, lots of camps. Flag. A flag, a pea flag. And you just basically have to go and squat down and pee by the flag. Um, and there are also all types of different arrangements. Um, for example, have I told the story about the seal? No. No. Okay. So I was with some um, glaciologists uh, at the Mackay Glacier, and what their job was was they were, had to send they sent remote operated vehicles down to the seabed. So basically, they were mapping the seabed. There were six of them, and they'd been there for the whole summer. So they had a very nicely set up camp. And they had a fantastic um, lavatory situation uh, where they drilled this hole and put a lovely, one of those, like a camping lav on top of it with a lovely 
uh, polystyrene seat and a big um, windbreaker around it. So it was just the most fantastic view of any lavatory in the whole world. And um, on my second day in camp, I was making some tea, I remember, for everybody and carrying the tea across. The t and one of the guys, one of these glaciologists, came skidding across the ice with his wind pants around his ankles. I said, Christ, Mike, what's happened? And he'd been sitting on this lav and a seal had come up. <laughs> and it was a hot, fishy breath. <gasps> how, how did you get that fantastic gig as a writer in residence in Antarctica? Um, well, it was a scheme that they had, which was part of the Two Worlds program of um, we need to uh, try and convey what scientists are doing to the wider community. So you just had to apply, but as a writer, you had to have a publishing contract with an American house. So get a, get a publishing contract with an American house, show it to them and you can go. So how long did it take you to do that? To Two years. Do you think it would be harder now? No, not particularly. I think it would still take two years, and you still have to work as a waitress like I did. But it's like anything. If you, you, if you want to do something enough, you can do it, but you have to really want to enough. Of those seven months you spent there, what would you say was the absolute highlight? Like when you think of it, what, what do you oh, picture? It's so, diff it's so difficult for me to answer that, Kate. Um, I mean, getting to the South Pole was quite something. <clears throat> um, but I had so many uplifting experiences with scientists learning about what it was that they did and understanding uh, how, in fact, because in England, as you know, our education system is extremely specialised at a very early age. So I'd given up all sciences at the age of three, you know, and just done millions of languages and humanities and so on. And I didn't really sort of understand what science was about. And I think some of my most illuminating experiences in the Antarctic was when talking to scientists in the tents and realising that actually they were only trying to unravel what it is to be human, like I was too. I wonder how many people in the audience have actually been to the polls? Anyone? Or, or who want to go? <laughs> uh, do we have any more questions for Sarah from the audience? Yes. Can you share how did you get into travel writing? How did it all start? Yeah, how did it all start? Well, uh, my mother has um, school reports or school diaries from when I was eight saying I want to be a writer. So I think that, you know, it's something, we might say it's a gift, we might say it's a curse, but I always wanted to be a writer. And it was just, you know, it came naturally to me that it was a vehicle. I think people are either born fiction writers or non-fiction writers, and I was very much a non-fiction writer. And um, I love traveling. And it just, it just seemed to me to be the perfect vehicle. So once I left college, um, I studied classics at university. And once I left university, I started building up a freelance portfolio, you know, getting things published in magazines and newspapers, coping with all the rejections and what everybody goes through. And um, Does that answer your question? I just just sort of started, and as I say, read all the time. Decide what you like, what you don't like. Do you normally secure a publishing contract before starting to write, or sometimes you write something and then approach a publishing house afterwards? So, yeah, so the question is about whether uh, I have a publishing contract before I start to write. Um, I think it's just, it's, for me, it's just always been too hard if I don't have a contract. It's just too risky. I've just got to know, especially all those years when I was single, you know, I've just got to know. Somehow or other, I've got to pay the bills at the end of it. So I've certainly never embarked on a book without a contract. 
journalism's a different question. I have often sent off things on spec. You have to, I think. But in terms of a book, it was just too hard. In your travel, have you ever encountered a dangerous or bad situation that you can share with us? Not really. I think bad things happen in London. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, I live in a big city. Not really. I've had lots of I've had malaria and scabies and all sorts of unpleasant illnesses. Um, but nothing serious. Um, How I think did you get scabies? Mm, scabies? I got scabies in Patagonia. It's not that bad a thing to get scabies, but it's not very pleasant. And you have to put the treatment, or was then, put um, lotion all over your body and then not wash for two days um, to let it... Anyway, it was all rather unpleasant. And, oh, yeah, God, I've had... I've had everything, yeah, but um, nothing serious. Um, yeah, I, think, I do think bad things happen in London. I think you have to be optimistic and believe. Have you ever climbed up high mountains like the Everest or so? Have you ever climbed up high mountains like no, the Everest? I don't, I don't really do that. Um, I'm not a climber. I don't have any physical skills. Um, but uh, when, on the day that my book about the Arctic was published, my eldest son said to me, oh, mum, how do you feel today? Uh, you've given so much of your life to being in the polar regions and writing about the polar regions. How do you feel today, now that it's come to a conclusion? And I thought about it and I said, I'm really glad there's only two polar regions. And he said, Mum, you know they call Everest the third pole. <laughs> I wish you hadn't said that. <laughs> I would, just would not have the physical skills to do that. I'd be hopeless. And I have had altitude sickness twice. Um, as, as you probably know, altitude sickness is something that you're not prone to, so climbers can climb up a billion times and then get it on the million and one time. And um, I, that was, yeah, it was quite frightening, yeah. I was frightened, actually, when I got altitude sickness. It's, it's not very nice. There was a book, Into the Denial, where they named all the steps uh, right up to the Everest. Uh, did you uh, name the, the, the places you've been to the poles, like um, named up after the expeditors? Or also, like uh, there was a, in, into the thin air, there was a Hillary step. The, after the Hillary step, you got to the Everest. Uh, did you name the, the, the polar regions after expeditors and uh, after the certain names you got to a place and uh, you conquered uh, the, the expedition? Thank you. Yeah, I wear hearing aids and um, the, the uh, acoustics are difficult. So, could you tell me what? Has anything, have any places been named after Sarah, or, or just generally? No, no, um, named after any expeditors. Uh, once you cross those regions, you reach a certain point that you conquer something, and then uh, once that step is conquered, you can move on, like uh, climbing up the Everest, like into the thin air, they have the steps and uh, the ridges named after expeditions, and uh, uh, those people conquered the first. Oh, loads, I think so. I think loads. As, the, um, as you say, the Hillary Step, and uh, there's various places in the Arctic that have been named after Nansen, whom I mentioned. Um, there's the Nansen Ridge, and um, there's loads of places in uh, the Antarctic named after Scotsmen. Like I mentioned, the Mackay Glacier, that was named after one of his men. And there's Scott Ridge, and Scott this, and Scott that. And there's the Shackleton Glacier. Um, and uh, yeah, lots. There's lots, lots of. If, if you're asking about top, if explorers have had toponyms, um, there's masses of them. And um, uh, when they're naming features on maps um, in the polar regions, they're sort of crying out for um, things to call them by. I remember once I was um, hiking in the Antarctic and just just away from camp for a few hours. 
And I had a USGS map with me, that's the US Geological Survey, which made all the maps at that time of the Antarctic. And of course, all the features had been named by um, the scientists who were there. And there was a very pointy mountain, and they called it the Doesn't Matter Horn. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. Um, and I think I did have a couple of things named after me, but I don't think know if that's stood the test of time. Like what? Um, well, I was with the writer in residence. Um, it was writers and artists in residence, and we were called W O O one two three. There was only one or two of us a year, so they called. So we were called Woos, and there was there's, there's, uh, there is a Woo Ridge, and a Woo Mountain, this and that or the other. It's not hard to get something named after you in the polar regions. It's incredible when you think about it, you know, Shackleton and the, the early explorers, when they went down, what, what they were wearing. Oh. All their woolies. And, you just can't yeah. believe it. And, of course, all that stuff, when it froze and then unfroze, it weighed a ton. I mean, it's it really damnable how they could achieve anything dragging round reindeer, imagine a reindeer fur sleeping bag. It gets wet, it freezes, and then it defrosts. It's like dragging a bison after you, like Cecil the lion, you know? It was just, it's amazing that more of them didn't die, in my opinion. Most I mean, quite a lot did die. Most of the kit that you had on when you were there, were, were you lent it? Yes, or, oh, okay. it's stuff you can't buy on the, in the market. There's nothing on the market that prepares you for those conditions. So it's stuff that's manufactured for government programs. Um, and I was lent it and then gave it back after. So you get yourself kitted out in Christchurch, New Zealand, or wherever, uh, or in the Falklands, mm -hmm. and uh, have all the kit. There, you know, people are very keen not to take you there unless you're properly protected. Nobody wants to bring a dead person home, you know. So, yeah, it's all um, specially manufactured stuff. It's not, not the same stuff as you were in the Lake District, you know. What do you think about all the cruises that go down there now? I mean, tourism to Antarctica is, is huge. Well, it's not that huge when you consider the size of it. I mean, it's one and a well, half... A lot bigger than it was when you went, when you correct, first went. But it's one and a half times the size of the United States... And how many thousands of people go there? Not very many. I think it's nothing. If you're going to make a list of environmental tourist problems in the world, Antarctica would rank at about 28,500. I mean, it's, the impact is very small. And because it's a very um, immature market, so it started very late, it's very well policed. So all those cruise ships, they have an observer, an official observer on board, who's checking that they get rid of their waste, you know, in the way they should, and this and that. So it's really well policed. So in my opinion, um, tourism in the Antarctic is, uh, compared to all the problems we have in this terrible world, very small. And imagine people who go to Antarctica are quite conscientious as well. I mean, exactly, yeah. yeah. They're invested in it. Yeah, they're not looking to chuck Pringles tubes into the Southern Ocean. Yes, you're quite right. And uh, very much, um, you know, when they go, I understand, I've never been on an Antarctic cruise, but I understand that when they go uh, and to land, walk on penguin colonies, they're among penguins, they're very uh, carefully monitored and told how to behave and this and that, you know, so that nothing gets spoiled. So, um, I think it's a small thing. Any more questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, you, you just talked about um, that you write every day, and no matter where you are. So um, how do you know when your book is ready? Oh. Um, how, how many, did you, I mean, because some of the books, like, like fiction, is you quite tell obvious. Me. Well, <laughs> Because sometimes like, when, you, when you read a novel, then you have the beginning and the end, but things like you write, and how do you know when it's ready? No, I don't think you do, really. I mean, 
typically what's happened with every book I've ever written is I've come to a point where I've thought, I think this is done, and I've sent it off into the oxygen, my agent and my editor and various other readers I have. And the word quickly comes back that indeed it's not ready at all <laughs> and needs an awful lot done to it. And um, no, it's a nightmare. You never do know. And it never is ready, really. You could always make things better. You could always make anything better. So who's I think it comes to the point where you just get so exhausted with it <laughs> that you've just, you know, enough. Who's your first reader? I have a few readers. Um, um, I have three friends, um, and I have my agent, and I have my editor in London, and I have my editor in New York. So they all pretty much have a go, and they all say something different. <laughs> okay. And are the friends writers as well? So no, do you? actually not. No. It's quite, a, it's quite a skill, actually, being somebody's reader. Because you have to understand that what I don't want them to say is, this is fabulous, you're a star. It's a pointless exercise. So it's quite a skill. My best friend is a banker. I'm actually just retired as a banker. And uh, somehow or other, you know, she can do it. But I think she just looks at it as a reader. And is she a big reader herself? Pretty big, but she's a you know she's a banker, so she's been working banker's hours for thirty years. Um, so not enormous, but somehow or other she can just she can just do it. It is quite a skill. Yeah, it is quite a skill. Do you think there's quite an appetite in the publishing industry for travel books and travel biographies, biographies of people who travel? Well, it goes in waves. Um, as all literary genres do, you know, it was a big success in the 30s, then there was a huge wave of success in the 70s with Paul Theroux and uh, all of his ilk, all of, you know, the generation above me, all those blokes who are sort of 30 years above me, who are all still going strong, most of them anyway. Um, and then it fell off, and so nobody would touch it with the barge pole. Um, and I think it's sort of evened out now. Do you think... Do you think in terms of going digital, you, you just think about the, the printed book? Would you ever want to produce something from a trip that was shared in a different way? Well, all my books are e-books, and they, they, just, they do rather well. Um, I don't think I've ever thought about whether, why would I ever do just an e-book? I mean, there's libraries, which I'm passionate about. And they need proper books, as I think of them still. Um, Have you inspired your children to, to travel or to write? To travel, certainly, yes. They're both bone idle, so um, they don't read or write very much. Um, but they are big travellers, yeah. Yeah. So where's your next family trip? Um, well, I'm trying not to go anywhere until I've got this Russian book under my belt, um, but I am taking them to Greece uh, for a week um, shortly. Um, and, um, yeah, I'll just get Russia out of the way and then um, we'll see. Come back here, I hope. Love to. So will the Russia book, was, will it be the same publisher? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I don't like change. So do you do a deal, a next number of book deal, or is each one individual? Yes. Each publishing yes. contract? Yes. Yes, you just sign a contract for each book. Yeah. There's no need to look ahead. But they're very loyal to me, and I hope I'm loyal to them. Anything else? Any other questions? from? Yes. Do I choose the place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, the yes. It's usually one thing leads to another, and um, I'd always wanted to write about Russian literature, for example, in this, this latest book I'm writing about. I wanted to go to Russia and was very interested in all types of things about Russia. Um, so, yes, it's something, something um, tends to strike me. 
I would just have seen that the, the object has come back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Any guesses? Yeah. Is it a tusk of a narwhal? Very good guess, <laughs> but wrong, but near, <laughs> but near. See how nicely carved it is. Close, yeah, but what? Hmm? No, not a tooth, no. It is a wal, it, it does come from a walrus. Hmm? It's not a tusk, no. Are we giving up? A, a collarbone? No, it's not a collarbone. It is a bone. So we've got, it's a walrus bone. Are we guessing that which type of bone? Correct, yeah. <laughs> you are tough. A private area, correct. Well done. It's a walrus penis bone. I always like to produce this because it makes men feel so inadequate. <laughs> <laughs> so, so who carved it? It's an, an, an indigenous thing in the Chukotka region of Russia um, that they, it's like, um, what do you call it, scrimshaw, that they did, did with whale bones, the sailors used to do. And um, yeah, they carve, they carve them. Um, but it's the largest penis bone pro rata of any creature. So is it a fertility symbol or? A I don't think so. No, I think it's. I don't think it is. I don't. I don't really know. But they uh, go in for it a lot, as I say, like Scrimshaw um, carving. Does it like a lucky charm for you? Well, I don't know about that. I might. I can hit my children over the head with it every now and again. <laughs> your house must just be full of souvenirs from your travels. Of, it is full of useless things. My husband always says we don't want any more crap coming in here. <laughs> now, do you have different rooms of different themes or it's just stuff everywhere? No, not really. It's pretty much... Um, well, there's no penis bone room, if that's what you mean. <laughs> have you been to Bhutan? I never have. I'd love to go. You know what have you I'm been? thinking of. Don't no. Oh. Bhutan. People have been to Bhutan? I would love to. I want to go to Bhutan and Mustang. They have huge, on the sides of their houses, for luck, they have these huge paintings of phalluses. Massive, like eight I foot tall. I didn't know that. You've got to go now. <laughs> it it's protects the house. It's lucky. Yeah. I wonder what's on people's wish lists to travel, like, of the more exotic variety. Got exciting trip planned. Oh, oh I know, actually, I know gorgeous. who you are. <laughs> are you going to climb up? Congratulations. God, well done. How fantastic. I'd love yeah. to do that. That's climbing. Mm -hmm. That's climbing. I know, yeah. I'd be hopeless that no, I'd completely be absolutely pathetic. I don't know where the most, like, exotic hit list place to go is at the moment. For a while, North Korea, four or five years was in, and that's kind Correct. of, I think, slipping out of favor. Correct. And I think they've just banned Americans. I just read that yeah. today. I've, yeah. I'm not going to North Korea. <laughs> I haven't had very good experiences there. I don't know which is the most exciting place right now. Personally, I really want to go and see the Northern Lights, but I don't know whether that counts as super exciting now. Because I feel like I see them the on Southern Instagram Lights. all the time. <laughs> or the Southern Lights. Oh, right, Southern Lights. Have you seen them? Yeah. I've Where? seen the Northern and the Southern Lights, yeah. Where did you oh, see the, the Northern ones? I saw the Northern ones in uh, Alaska. Uh -huh. um, and the oh, Southern... Right, District. Correct, yeah. And um, the southern ones, obviously, in the Antarctic. I mean, they're the same, effectively. It's the same chemical phenomenon. But could you tell the difference between the two? No. No, I'm, nobody could, I'm sure. It's uh, the same. 
It's the same interaction, physiological interaction that's going on. But you can see them from Scotland, can't you? The north you can, of apparently, yeah. Okay. Next time. <laughs> well, I thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you. And um, thank you very much, audience. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. hope I've entertained you in some small degree. Great, thank you. And thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you.